as most of you know, we're doing this series on like the core values of Hope Church, what we're, what we're build, what are we building, what's it, the flavor. It's not just about where we're going, but what is it we are building together? What is the nature of that? What is the core elements of that? Oh, thanks, Jen. And uh, I, I'm here, I'm rounding off the section we've just done on honor. So hopefully you know what our three absolute core things are by now. Well, maybe. <laughs> so, presence, honor, legacy. legacy. Okay, yes, listening, some listening. Presence, honor, legacy. Let, let's do it all together, then you won't feel so embarrassed. Our three core values are presence, presence honor, honor, legacy. So, we spent a lot of time on presence and packing that with you. Uh, we've been doing honor, and we will move on next week, I think, to. What do we mean by legacy? Now, some of it will be familiar. Hopefully, a lot of it will be familiar because this is the journey we've been on over the last few years of discovering God's assignment to us. And I've been thinking about a prophetic word that we had as a church probably 10 years ago. We had this terrible season that we went through. And at the end of it, two different people who didn't know one another, one was John Sharp, who was part of this church, uh, John and Maddie, who are now in Belgium, and, and another was a, a prophet friend of mine who came and ministered to us. And, and the word was not very long, but it was very profound. It says, big hole, big foundation, big church. Both of them had the same thing, which is interesting and always should get our attention, particularly when God speaks, but particularly when he says it twice. <laughs> it's a bit like Jesus, you know, verily, verily. He's, he's really, really wanting you to know. You know. We use it in English, don't we? Really, really, or those kind of, we're trying to make a point by saying it twice, big hole, big foundation, big church, and, and really what we're describing to you uh, in these weeks is, is what we now understand is our foundation, what are our core values, what is it we're building with and towards, what is the flavor of the environment that we believe that uh, Jesus wants to bless and flourish and grow, yeah? And so, it's put together in a way that is a series, that is a package, that is defined, hopefully, in a way we've never done it before, except many years ago when we started as a church. But actually, we did our kind of values and what we call foundation course then. But basically what's happened through all that we've encountered in God is that that has changed. So this is not, the, some of you have been around a long time, this is not actually the same church that you joined. Um, some of you are like, yeah, we figured that. That was kind of smart people. And, and it's taken a lot of time, a lot of encounter with God, study, prayer, to shift things from where we were to where we are now and where we want to go. Because some of the things that we have been dealing with are actually deeply challenging to our established British culture and our established British Christian culture. And what we've been saying is we needed a big hole because actually some things that we thought were normal and good needed thrown out. Some things that we thought habitually were the way it should happen in the Christian life are actually inhibiting us from encountering Jesus and changing the world, not enabling us. And we're still figuring that. And then that actually deeply challenges you to the core of your being. And particularly our leadership team and our elders. Oh my goodness, we have been through it. In terms of renew, being renewed inside out, dealing with core issues in our lives so that we can increasingly live what we're talking about. So if you found it challenging, welcome to the club. Jesus did say, follow me. And he didn't say, I will make you comfortable. Is that true? There's a discomfort because transformation or transfiguration, as we talked about last week, is actually learning to live our new nature, which means discarding and putting off our old, which means waving goodbye to some things we were comfortable with, we used to like, we used to think, maybe even were appropriate and helpful. And that... that 
that parting is a sweet sorrow. I wave goodbye to my envy. I used to like, envy was a friend. It, it, it was something I used, but actually it's not resonating, not harmonious with the Jesus in you who's increasingly trying to come out of you to other people around you. Do, do you see? So Jesus didn't promise a kind of, well, if the Christianity I'm receiving isn't comfortable, it can't be him. No, he actually said, take up your cross and follow me. He actually promised us that he would disciple us through some difficulties. Just a great introduction. <laughs> so here, here we are, and we're aiming, having packaged all this up, spoken to you about it, and you're sitting, listening there intently, listening, catching up, taking notes that when we're through all this in September, we're going to gather together and say, yay, this is who we are, and we're going to celebrate, and we're going to say, this is it, us, we're arising and we're building this. So we're kind of having a moment of just to kind of summarize and pull it all together. And it's really healthy for a community every now and again just to go, gather together and say, this is who we are, this is what we're going for, we rejoice, we're so glad with what God has done. So we're, gonna, we're creating a moment like that. We felt as elders that's what we needed to do having done. You're, you're sitting there receiving the blessing of a huge amount of work. And, and we want to just pull it all together Having established our eldership at the beginning of the year, then in the autumn, September 16th, we're going to go, yeah, we understood something. Now, there's not, there will always be fresh things. God will always be moving us on. But it's really good to know the number of the bus you're sitting on. And even to know that when you got on, and to now, the number changed. And, and, and that's okay, so everybody's free to get on the bus, to get off the bus. The big thing about freedom last week, it's got to be easy to join, easy to leave. There's no constraint or constriction. There's no like guilt trip if the bus number's different and you don't like the bus. Do you, that has to be okay. That has to be a freedom environment that we are creating. How, how are we doing this morning? Just, just look at, move a body part. There we go, that's fantastic. So I'm just, uh, God spoke to me this morning, and some of you, as I'm speaking, you're going to experience him in your body somewhere, like you can't get a warm ear or a tingly hands or warm feet or so, so, just, just, I think that's going to happen to some of you. Whoever that is, I'd really like to pray with you at the end. I believe it's a sign of God doing something in your body, in your life, and it's just going to happen. So I'm excited about that. And we're going we're gonna to do ministry time at the end. It's gonna, we're going to do it slightly differently. So hang on in there. All right. So this is like a summary, pulling together honor. We've talked about honor. And we've talked about the, the, the elements of honor, of identity, of love, of leadership, and freedom. And that these are all things, the components that support and express this culture of honor that we are seeking to build. And I want us to read together Matthew chapter 13 verse 54 to 58 and really this, this, this scripture pulls together everything we talked about in fact this scripture connects the presence of God the reality of his presence with this whole idea of, of honor the two things are not like two separate containers. They're actually linked together. One, a reason for developing our ability to honor one another and honor him is because we want to, to receive more of his reality amongst us. Do, do you see? Well, hopefully you will. Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> That's not in Matthew 13, but... <laughs> I can read it, Joel, if there's a problem. All right. If you have a Bible, open it on a device, or, and I'll read it to you as well. Matthew 13. I'll just pause briefly. 54, and I'll be reading the ESV, which says, And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished. And said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? 
is, this, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this, is, is, is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Are not all his sisters with us? Uh, where did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Wow. I first preached this message a long time ago. God showed this to me. And it was in a season years ago, I was seeking for more breakthrough in the realm of healing. And I was really shocked when I kind of read this. It's not as if I hadn't read it before, but you know, sometimes you read something and it, and it, and it impacts you because I couldn't get my head around. Here is Jesus, the Son of God, anointed with limitless amounts of the Holy Spirit, actually being limited by the reception of the people he went to. I'm going to say that again because it is so astonishing. Here is Jesus, the Son of God, anointed with limitless amounts of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was on him without measure. He was doing signs, wonders, and miracles, raising the dead everywhere else. He was the move of God on planet Earth. He shows up in Nazareth, and he is limited by the reception he got. When I saw that, I was, I was shocked. I was like, how... How can it be that a sovereign God could do less? And it hinged on how he was welcomed. It hinged on what was happening inside the people and what was coming out of their mouths. And here's the guy who's doing incredible miracles and all that happens here is he, he, the summary of it is he healed a few. And I preached the message, and I had no context for this idea. And it, but it just so happened that as I preached this message, in, in the church we were leading at that time, was a, a well-known, nationally known and respected prophet. He happened to be sitting there. And I was a young guy then, and he was the older guy. And at the end of the message, he came up to me and said, what you just preached is a word for our nation. And, you know, you're sitting there as whatever I was, 30-year-old going, really? So that's absolutely key for our nation. And in that time, I kind of reflected back and went back to God about this. And huh, this is what he said to me. He says, honor is the key to revival in the UK. Prayer is not the key to revival in the UK. Prayer is not the key to, this is what he's saying to me, prayer is not the key to revival in the UK, honour is the key to revival in the UK. Father was saying to me, there's plenty of prayer taking place, but the capacity of the people in the church to receive the people I'm going to use as revival catalysts is limited, and so the work I can do is limited. Shall I go now? (laughs) Plenty of prayer is taking place, and I believe that's still the case, but the capacity of the people in the church to receive the people I'm going to use as revival catalyst is limited, so the work I can do is limited. That's what's happening in Nazareth. Honor is the key to revival. Who here would like revival? Most of us. The thing is, we have to adjust our inner world so that we actually like the people he sends revival through. So when I first saw this, I had no place in my experience of what this honor thing could look like. What, what does this mean? It, 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 how do we work this out? Really, it, it was landing in a space inside me that went, I believe this, but I don't really know how this works out. And the other thing that started to happen in that time and has happened ever since is I can remember driving a car and and was listening to a cassette tape. I know it ages me. (laughs) Time when a cassette tape in your car was cutting-edge technology. Some of you remember that. Um, 
And on the cassette tape, it was a, it, I think it was of a Bible week, Bible conference I'd been to, uh, the visiting speaker who was from America wanted to honor um, the wife of a Bible teacher who just died. And, and so he, he said, I really want to honor this woman called Eileen Wallace. Arthur Wallace was a Bible teacher, prophet, an amazing catalyst in the 60s, 70s for the church in the UK. And, and he, he'd suddenly died, and there was this big conference, and, and he really wanted to honor his wife in that moment. And the place erupted. And as soon as I heard this, I started to weep. And every time I've heard people publicly honored like that, it doesn't matter if it's Christian or not, it makes me cry since he spoke this thing to me. And you feel a bit, you know, oh man, I'm not supposed to cry. And I do I actually, some movies, you know, kind of like, Jesus like, you rubbing your eye? Yes, yes, there's something in my eye. And I'm, But my experience of honor, people use the word, was it was a, often a bit plastic, a bit forced. Uh, the, 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 the apostolic group we were part of way back then, uh, the leader of it had an anniversary. It was 25 years into his ministry, full-time ministry, and the team around him wanted to honor him. And the church leaders, which are, well, great, let's do that. So they're like, we wanted to give him a gift, and we're like, fantastic and uh, we want to buy him a car and at this point I'm thinking yeah that'd be cool and then it became we want to buy him a Mercedes I'm like Ooh. and then it wasn't just a Mercedes it was like top of the line Mercedes and then there was all this pressure to raise all this money to buy the guy this swanky car which we actually did but something inside this doesn't feel and then I know and I got to know him and afterwards he even felt uncomfortable he part around the corner so he couldn't be seen when he went to speak places because he got this sort of rather large Mercedes he'd be driving around in and, and when he felt comfortable he got rid of it and downsized because it just didn't fit and the way it was done didn't fit and yet in another apostolic movement similar situation came around and, and they gave the guy a sound system there must be something in the middle of this that, that, that sits better than a sound system or a top line. You, because it's good to honor these people. These people gave their lives. These people were godly people. But, but there's a way of doing this. Somewhere there must be a way of doing this that actually feels good. The, the people doing it and the people receiving it are really feeling the love. Yeah? Okay, so, so I, I went through, I lived through all of that and saw some, some things that you think are really uncomfortable, really nonsense, and, and you just think you almost stop using the word because you think this is just so uncomfortable. Um, and then I went to Bethel Church with Nick Treadgold and encountered a healthy version, something I'd never seen before. And Danny Silk, then when we went in 2009, was just beginning to, to speak about the culture of honor. And he'd, he'd done what we've been doing, which is he'd, he'd pieced together the culture they were generating around their leadership and in their church environment and put together a book and stuff that we've all done now. We've, got the, we've had Danny Silk here. We're like, the culture of honor, yeah. What the heck's a culture of honor? It's a culture where Jesus gets to show up. It's a culture where Jesus gets to be Jesus and do everything he wants to do. I, mean, I, love, I love what happens to people. A friend of mine went over. He leads a church of 50 people. He came back. He told me, he said... They were so honoring. I, I, he, he constantly has talked to me about how small his church is and how bad he feels about it and all this kind of thing. He said, I went there. They were like applauding me. Like, well done. He was like, I got 50 people. I said, yeah, you have 50 people. It's a different way of thinking. 
It's a different way of approaching people. They were you know, slapping him on the back spiritually, cheering him on spiritually because he had 50 people and he living in the culture here was like, well, well you got 50 people, what kind of leader am I? He came in there feeling like a giant with 50 people. You know what? He's going to get 150 people. Because the culture said, another friend of mine went, had this crazy big dream for a building that was going to cost millions. And it was the first place he ever went where he told people his dream. And they all went, that's fantastic. That's awesome. You should do that. God's going to do, God's with you. And he's going around. He was there for several weeks. He's going around going, nobody gave me a negative. Nobody critiqued me. Nobody said, well, that's a heck of a lot of money. You sure you thought about this properly? (laughs) Nobody did a British Christian thing on him. For weeks and weeks and weeks. I mean, are you, I mean, are you, because he had it. He told people, I want to do this building. And I know, I run. And they were like, well, that's, that's a bit beyond who you are, isn't it? <laughs> who do you think you are thinking you could do that and have that? And blah, 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 blah. And he goes to Bethel and they're like, man, that's amazing. You got the building. It's a different culture. British culture is cynical, cautious. It can be a bit mean spirited. Out there. But we don't want it in here. So we have to divest ourselves of what we grew up in and start to embrace who's growing up inside of us Jesus. We're brought up in cynicism and skepticism. I mean, it is a journey for me to remember good things. I have to work on remembering good things and forgetting bad things. How's it doing for you? We're singing about the goodness of God. Some of us are sitting here maybe going... Oh, yeah, I know he is, but man, I can't remember anything he's done. Actually, we're changing our inner culture to go, he's good. And he did that last week, and he did this week. Remember early days of seeing healings here? I struggled to remember. I I can literally remember praying, oh, God, please heal this week, because we haven't seen anything for weeks. And he's like, yeah, you have. You just forgot. (laughs) I needed the Holy Spirit to remind me that he'd actually, oh, wow, that's great, but still do more. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, it, it, it freaks you out. Both of these people I've talked about that went to Bethel, it, it freaked them out. They were so not used to being treated so positively with what they had. It was all about caution and wisdom dressed up as fear, dressed up as wisdom. And, and are you sure? And who do you think you are? They were used to all of that. They go there and they're like, they come back feeling like, going to change the world with 50 people going to build a building with millions and millions of pounds and it's going to happen and it did see the culture changes what God can do in you and through you we want that don't we don't we want that don't you want that don't you want someone you come up with your crazy idea and rather than someone going that's a crazy idea forget it they go wow that's amazing let's see God do it Okay, so what can, we, what can we learn from Jesus here? Our passage, it's in the Bible to help us. It, 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 that's a clue, isn't it? If it's in there, and it's in three Gospels. So it, it, it's really, really, really trying to help us. So that's a good point. Anyway, um, here's, here's me sort of putting some different paraphrases on what's, they're just slightly different ways of developing what's in the text, all right? So in effect, he's saying, his number one version If you're offended by someone because you think they are a bit too big for their boots, someone who was just like you and now is knocking it out of the park in the public arena, you can limit their functioning God. There's a slightly even more uncomfortable version of what he was saying. He is saying if you or I, this is us, are suspicious of how they got what they got. All right, this is something else that happens in our British culture. If you're eyes suspicious of how they got what they got, because you knew them when they weren't like that. And when you knew them, 
they didn't do that. If that's inside of you, then you and I can limit what we and others can receive from them. This created a corporate environment in which he was limited. So say he was carrying these incredible miracles and someone there was dying of cancer. He could have healed them, but a whole bunch of other people with a grumpy attitude meant that it didn't happen. Here's another version. If you're so familiar with them and their family that you can only see the person through the lens of familiarity, you are judging them and so limiting their effect in in you and around you. How are we doing? If you're so locked, if you've so locked them into your old experience of them that despite reports from everywhere else, you can't let go of what your view of them is, The limited experience of them that you had continues to be the limited experience that you have. So if what you're hearing doesn't allow your expectation to change, your expectation starts to fashion what you continue to receive at the same level as what you used to receive. Is another way way of expressing what he's saying. He's saying if you can't let people you know become extraordinary because you know really you're the same as them. If in your history with them you were their equal, and in fact sometimes you beat them, you were better than them in class, you made better cabinets, you you were a fellow carpenter, I don't know. If it deep inside is like, I'm as good as them. And if your need for equality means that they can't become more prominent or effective than you, you will keep receiving the old version of them that you hold in your heart and not the reality literally stood in front of you. Here is God, almighty, Jesus, son of God, fully anointed with the Holy Spirit, stood in front of them, and they were still getting from him carpenter. Everything they needed was stood in front of them and they couldn't see it because they were holding on to an old thing or they were holding on the need to be his equal. They're holding on to, they don't want to feel that, yeah? You only get out of them what you value in them. And that's the problem with familiarity is you end up stumbling over what people aren't and not able to rejoice and receive and see what they are. So a culture of honor has to be full of people who keep learning to see what the Jesus that is in people, not the bits they don't have yet. And this isn't just for leaders. This is for every tier and strata and every connection in the body of Christ It applies to leadership, but it's not just for leaders. It's the environment is where it works. It's where you can get from the person next to you as much as you see in them. And everybody, I guarantee that every single one of you looking back at me through your eyes is going, I want people to see me for what I really carry because I know there's something awesome inside me. Who's going to see it? Who's going to celebrate it? Who's going to honor it? You know what you need to do? Do it for somebody else. Culture of honor is not a weapon to hit other people over the head with because you're not being honored. If that's what we do with it, it is, or it is still a culture of dishonor. You just dishonored the environment because it's not giving you what you think you should get in a culture of honor. No, actually, every single person has to posture themselves in a place of, I am going to be honorable. I am creating the culture of honor. I have joined the culture of honor club, and I leave. I stop paying my pres- pre- prescription. <laughs> that thing. Conscription, no. Subscription. I no longer am a paid-up subscribed member to the culture of dishonor.
And it has a collective effect. So Jesus walked into a, we call it atmosphere. That he was amazed at, he talks about the group, their unbelief. They took offense at him. There was a corporate offense coming back at Jesus. And if you think about it, this is common in the teaching of Jesus. So when he sent out the 12 and the 72, he talked, when you are received well, release your peace into that place. If you're not, take it back and take it with you. And the word peace is connected to shalom. So he's talking about release, which means the fullness of well-being. So apostles carry a fullness of well-being that they can release into environment. But if the environment is not receiving it, they can take it back and go to somewhere that's worthy of receiving it. And that's what was happening with Jesus here. He was in finding an environment that was not receiving him. So it was limiting what they were receiving or what he could release. It means that there can be a God-sized, super humongous, beautiful, miraculous delivery stood right in front of us and it's possible to miss it because we don't like the human it's coming. I mean, I, I went through the mill on this. I'm still, still processing, still processing. I, I actually sat down one day and said, what would be my worst nightmare? And I invented this person that I couldn't handle if God sent revival through them. And I realized how many issues I still had. Just, I mean, it's worth doing for yourself. Do you want to know mine? Now, don't be offended because I have changed from the moment that I got this. Because this may apply to some of you. But not anymore. All right, I've repented, I'm cleansed, I'm redeemed by the resurrected blood of Jesus. All right, so, but, but this, is, this is what I was having to deal with as back then a, a paid up, fully subscribed member of the Dishonored Club and also as a well trained pastor in those ways. So I sat down and said, God, tell me who I couldn't receive revival through. And he said, glad you should ask that question because here we go, because there's quite a big list. Are you ready? He said, you would have a real problem <laughs> if a black divorced woman with no theological training started meetings in your city and revival was breaking out. So I'm like, oh crap. A racist, misogynist, and have a snooty idea about theological training. <laughs> and women. Well, I did have, but that was the, the world I was in had a thing about women. So I did mention misogynist, that's, that applies. So I clearly had some repenting to do. How are you doing with yours? <laughs> I also discovered later that I didn't like scruffy people and I didn't like shouty people. Scruffy, if you look scruffy, revival can't come through you. I mean, you could be raising the dead, but if you're scruffy, I'm going to have a problem. My mom, God rest her soul, I love her to bits. She's with him in heaven. She was always well-dressed. She was always buying me clothes. And in the 70s, she'd buy me trendy clothes that I hated, but I had to wear. But our whole family was like, you dress up. That was my history. <laughs> Poorly dressed people can't be the source of revival. <laughs> What's yours? What do, you need, what do you need to nail this morning? Just nail it right now. I mean, I probably had other issues too, but those are all that I could handle at that particular point in time. I don't like scruffy people. I don't like shouty people. But you know, what if... It was a scruffy person, but God was using them to reach thousands of people because they connected. What if the shout, every shout was anointed? I mean, people went to the Welsh revival and the miners were weeping and the tears were running down their faces and running 
through the coal dust in their faces and they had their hobnail boots on which is what they worked in and they were dancing on the pews people who heard the revival went and cracked open the door and looked and shut the door and went away because they hated what they saw that this can't be God and basically the revival passed them by there's plenty of stories of that in, in sort of 100 year old plus church history if we want revival we've got to be able to cope with I mean, it begins with the person next to you. Everybody would honor Billy Graham. Especially if he showed up today. That would be pretty amazing. <laughs> Everybody, like Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson came, most of you would be like, oh, Bill, wow, we really, they'd receive, you'd receive loads from Bill. What about the person next to you? You know them probably a lot better than you know Bill. I met Bill. He's lovely, not perfect, amazing, amazing man of God. How you do? So this this starts right in the uncomfortable spot with the intersection of the person you're married to, the person you're sitting next to, the person that you relate to in Hope Church, the leaders in Hope Church. Let's kick out dishonor, skepticism, criticism. It completely takes the wind out of the sails of any kind of revival God would want to breathe into an environment. Historically, it is the killer. It's one of the reasons the revivals only last for two years. It's not that God stopped moving, it's people have got grumpy. So what if, what if, and, and I'm going to land on this and then we're going to do some ministry. Okay. What, let's paint Nazareth differently. What if they'd gone, hey Jesus, you're back. We remember you, you made some decent kitchen cabinets in your time. We hear and we see you're doing some mighty stuff down the road. Glad you came back. We'd like to see some, we'd like, we'd like to get to know the, the new you. Um, I mean, we know he didn't get it from your earthly dad or your brothers and sisters. We know them, but you're, you're packing something awesome. We want to find out what that is. You mean a lot to us. It's so good that you're a son of our city and you're out there doing amazing stuff because it's a well-known phrase. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's what actually Nathaniel said. It's in the Bible. So obviously Nazareth had a bit of a down at heel reputation. And they could have gone, hey, you're knocking it out of the park, Jesus. You're lifting the profile of our whole town. Come on, be awesome. We want your success. Let's celebrate with Jesus is here, everyone. You know, the guy that made your kitchen table, he's here and he's raising the dead. Come on, let's have a revival meeting. He's a great son of our town. He's honoring our town. What if they loved him in the Bible sense of rejoicing in truth and hoping and believing in all things? They missed a trick here. They could have been more than just his birthplace, oh yeah, and Nazareth, that didn't receive him. But maybe what they did was because they couldn't escape the roots that meant that their reputation was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It would be great if Hope Church was known for raising mighty revivalists that we could raise up and honor crazy fire carriers for the all of our nation and the nations. They're sitting next to you with all their weaknesses, flaws and problems. They're sitting there and there's a fire in them going, I want to come out. <laughs> there's a lot more I could say, but that's going to that's gonna do today let's create a positive spiral a whirlwind of celebration yeah well, well I'm not sure about that I'm not sure about that either. well enjoy your not being sure I'd like to celebrate